broadcasting under the night sky from the edge of an undisclosed jungle on the Gulf of Mexico. I'm Christopher Garitano, your voice in the night. For the next hour, allow me to be your guide into the bizarre unknown, the fantastic macabre, and together we'll journey to that borderland between fiction and reality, a place beyond all rational explanation. We are now off to the witch. Can you see us or any of our lights? The audio that you just listened to was several variations of a technique called EVP electronic voice phenomena. The responses to the questions, not audible to the human ear, were amplified and isolated later, and are said to be voices from beyond the grave. Tonight's guest uses science to explore allegedly haunted locations, to collect and analyze data for the purposes of hopefully one day proving that there's an existence beyond death, or perhaps a more complicated explanation. We'll hear his story and his perspective after this commercial break. After these messages, we'll be right back. You are listening to the Off to the Witch podcast, where we explore that bizarre borderline between fiction and reality and all subjects arcane. Journey over to my YouTube channel and subscribe now at youtube.com slash at off to the witch for a variety of extras and special features, including the off to the witch mini docs with further insights on many of the latest episodes, as well as previews and behind the scenes of my forthcoming investigative series off to the witch presents, as well as the anniversary edition of my motion picture documentary Montauk Chronicles and follow us on social media. All links are available at linktree.com slash garitano7, G-A-R-E-T-A-N-O-7. And stay tuned for more Off to the Witch. Long ago, on a cold, dark night, in this peaceful New England village, something happened. Something too terrifying to remember. Something too frightening to forget. Something that has remained a secret until now. Is anyone else seeing these? Am I the only one having nightmares? Universal Pictures presents Fred Astaire, Melvin Douglas, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., John Hausman, Ghost Story, from the terrifying best-selling novel by Peter Straub. Who is this? He's found a picture of her. That's not possible. The girl, the men, the evil, silence. Dad, I'm telling you something happened. I'm telling you something. I think he may have been murdered. The house, the fear, the nightmares, the vengeance, the terror, the truth. Not now, Rick. Yes, now. Something's happening. Something terrible. I fear that more of us are going to die. No, we, we, we must talk about it. Ah, uh, she is not the person that you think she is. <laughs> Who are you? Oh, no, please, let's not stop. She's worried you have the wrong idea about her. Everything about her is wrong. No, please, please let me talk Dave, about her. Get away from her, Dave. <laughs> what are you? She's dangerous. Listen to me, please. <laughs> Soon they will learn that they have never been forgiven. <laughs> Ghost story. The time has come to tell the tale.
Welcome back to Off to the Witch. I'm your host, Christopher Garitano. And tonight's guest, Zach Haino, is a scientist and an electrical engineer who builds and designs devices and methods to specifically analyze haunted locations. His ongoing research is considerable, and he hopes to inspire the scientific community to explore a possible explanation to the ghostly phenomena that millions of people have experienced throughout human history. So here's my interview with Zach Haino. You know, I was born and raised in, in southern New Jersey. Um, and honestly, I didn't really grow up in a family that necessarily was into the paranormal or ghost hunting or anything. Um, you know, it wasn't something I know a lot of people grew up, you know, different ways. But, um, you know, we grew up religious. You know, I'm, I'm a Christian, I, I'd say, you know, by faith. You know, we really didn't think of that. You know, it wasn't necessarily a taboo, but it, it didn't really you know, cross our minds like a lot of people. Now, our local community for Halloween, they always had this event at this uh, local tavern. I'm trying to think, I think it was probably, it was definitely Revolutionary War because, I mean, anything in the Northeast over here, any building in the Northeast over here, uh, it's always the claim that, you know, it was a revolutionary hospital at one point and there was always a uh, uh, George Washington either stayed there or lived there at one point. And obviously the same story was true for this place. I was probably about 10 at the time. I was was there with my my good friend, Max. You know, we grew up together. Uh, and it was my mom, his mom, and, and my, my younger brother. It's funny. It's always the moms. I don't know. I mean, at least in, in my experience, it's always the moms that were interested. The dads had, you know, no interest in doing this. Um, but uh, basically, it was a, a Halloween event where we would go there. It was like a ghost tour. They had a local paranormal group. And that was my first exposure to the paranormal or the paranormal investigation um, side of, of, you know, the paranormal. So uh, it was really interesting. So they take you in, um, they showed some videos, you know, it was like a little demonstration. They had like these posters and stuff. Um, at first I thought it was kind of cheesy. Um, and then they took us to another room where our first experiment was to, you know, test out dowsing rods. And I had no idea what dowsing rods were, you know, they started moving around in all different directions. I think that the goal was, and my, my friend was reminding me of this not too long ago. I didn't really remember at the time, but um, he uh, he was telling me that they put crystals or, or something or some type of, it was either crystals or rocks or something around the room where you, um, you'd have to find them with the dowsing rods. Now, I don't, I don't specifically remember that, but he said that what happened was there was crystals all out the room, so all throughout the room. So no matter where the dowsing rods pointed, it was basically pointing to a crystal. So, okay, so you were at this event, and obviously it sparked uh, a strong interest at that time, no? You went to this event, it was new, it was fresh. Let me ask, before you answer this question, um, were you exposed to any movies like most of us at the time, like horror films, ghost stories? Did you already have an interest in these things? (laughs) Not not necessarily an interest, but I will say, um, at least compared to my cousins and, and some of my friends, my mom would always let us watch uh, kind of scarier movies. I mean, nothing crazy, not not like The Exorcist or anything like that. But um, I, I remember, I mean, I can't remember what year it came out, but uh, Signs, Mel Gibson Signs. And, um, you know, we, I was just a young kid and I know there was a my brother watched it too, and my my parents saw it before, make sure it was you know it's it was, it's okay, it's appropriate. Um, and I still remember getting that fear of you know just seeing that those uh, those aliens um, for the first time. So I, I did grow up watching, um, I guess, horror movies uh, a little more advanced than my age, at least in my circle. Um, but I never really like took them to light. Like I, they never they never really kept me up at night because uh, I guess I could you know understand that this was just a movie it wasn't you know necessarily portraying actual events um so early on it really didn't it didn't um i don't think it really shaped me as as some people have was there any singular moment when you were a kid that made you contemplate on a haunted house or a haunting anything in particular that you can associate with that 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 scared you well, if I, if so, in this event that we were at, um, it continued on. They showed us the electrical. The next room, it was like segmented out because it was an old house. The next room, they took us to a, a um, an area where they had um, 
more of the electronic devices, you know, voice recorders, I guess it was K2 meters at the time. And it was really fascinating because I was always interested in electronics and, and engineering so, stuff. So I thought that was neat. And then when we were there, someone actually fell down the stairs. We didn't see it, but we heard it and, you know, it was a big commotion. And, you know, after, I guess, every, you know, I think everybody was fine, but we went upstairs. That, that's, that was our next step was to go <laughs> step next portion of the, the tour was to go upstairs and we were all scared. Oh no, we're going to get pushed down the stairs. You know, we were all on edge. We went upstairs and there was a small room where they ran through EVP recordings. I had no, you know, experience or understanding of what this was. So they, they explained the phenomenon and they're playing clips. And I don't think it was necessarily clips that were um, recorded at this location. Uh, I believe it was somewhere else, but it was, it was, they said they were in a cemetery and, you know, you could hear, clearly hear a child's voice saying mommy. And, um, they swear that there was no children present. And, and I, for some reason that really stuck with me because it's like, if, if I'm really hearing what they're saying, it is like, am I, am I actually, you know, audibly hearing the voice of some, someone out there, someone that passed away, someone that you know, isn't, isn't in our time. Like it, it, it really struck me and it really like, I think that was kind of what interested me going forward. Sure. It's that, it's that moment that literally sends chills down your spine. When you, if you hear something like that and it occurs to you, or at least you believe that this is the disembodied voice of someone that was once human, a ghost is speaking. It's terrifying. Because there's so many things in your subconscious that are sparked right at, right at that moment. And so that must have hit you pretty hard. You believed when you heard that EVP, uh, which is, uh, what does that stand for again? Electronic voice phenomena? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I don't know if it was a full on belief, but it was the, the possibility for me like that we're actually hearing something else. Or I was also thinking if it's not... Like I, I, I ran through my head. What, what could it possibly be? You know, if, if I'm trusting them that there was no children present, you know, there has to be an explanation, or this is what they're saying. It is. It's it's a it's a spirit of a little girl. So obviously, we were all shaken up at that point. The next step and the final step, I guess, of this tour was to go into um, a room. We'd split up into two separate rooms. Our group turn the lights off. They give us these. Uh, they're like cheap. Um, K2 meters. So basically one little light on it. And it was supposedly supposed to, to light up if there was any EMF in the area. So we were in there. I was with my, my friend Max. And I think my brother was with us too. And the moms were in the, the other room. But um, we're, we're, you know, we're going around with a meter. And after hearing the, the EVPs, I'm kind of like, you know, my, my hair on the back, my neck standing up. And I'm just like, oh, wow, this could be, this could be real. All of a sudden, the rocking chair in the corner of the room started rocking. And that was like another, like, so that combined, combined with the EVP that we just heard, I was like, whoa, like the realization that this is a real possibility. This isn't just some hocus pocus Halloween scare stuff. This is, this is actually a possibility that, that I think that's truly what initially started my journey. And, you know, I could, I, I always talk to my friend Max about it and, and, um, you know, he, for him too, it was like, even though he's more of a skeptic he still remembers that moment. But I think the, the funniest thing was when my little brother, he's like f uh, four years younger than me. And I don't think he was grasping the whole concept of it, but right as the rocking chair is moving, he's getting the meter and going underneath of it and making, you know, trying to test, see what's going on. It's just funny that there's, I guess there's a certain age of, of understanding and like deep full impact, like how, like I, I was old enough to understand what this could be. And I think he was still, you know, in that innocence age where like he ne didn't necessarily understand that. Um, so it didn't really strike that fear like it did me. This thing hit you pretty hard when you were there. This was all new to you. You had never been to one of these paranormal gatherings before. And then you witness this phenomena and you see, and you believe it's real. When you got home that night, do you remember how you felt? Were you scared? You know, a lot of us get scared because it's like you, now you feel vulnerable where you didn't where you thought before being alone in the dark is just, it's just simple. You can go to sleep. Now there might be a spirit in there with you. Did you feel that way when you got home or were you excited to go and explore this further? You know what? I really think the, the, 
the fear did set in then. Um, I, I, I distinctly remember sleeping with my lights on for the next few nights. Um, because yeah, it's like, it's the fear of the unknown that, you know, if, if we're recording these things at the cemetery there, they, they recorded this, um, this voice or whatever at the cemetery, that chair was moving. Who's to say that it couldn't happen, you know, right in my very room. So I, I guess for a while I slept with the lights on, but it's funny because that's when I was, I was probably about 10 years old, I think, uh, maybe younger. I, I'm, I'm, you know, just running back trying to think what year that was, but after that moment, I really didn't have much, uh, a, a much of an encounter with the paranormal, you know, besides seeing the shows every once in a while on TV, um, for, for many years after that, um, it was like a big void. So I kind of went back to not even really thinking about it, um, until a really interesting event happened to me as I got into college. So you, you didn't really think much about it and then something actually happened. What was it? So this is, I would say this is more of my actual, you know, I guess, journey into this realm, because like I said, it kind of, it kind of died away after having a little experience as a kid. I didn't really think about that much until after this experience, looking back, it's like, wow, that was more profound than, than I, than I maybe remembered. So I transferred over to Drexel University. And at the time, I really wanted to try to get involved. I was never a big sports guy and everything. And, and I was trying to find like a group to to get involved in. And, you know, I've seen the shows and stuff on TV. And there, there, was, there was a group called Drexel's Pig. I was like, Pig, what is that? It, it was an acronym for Paranormal Investigation Group. So um, I, I emailed the, the main guy, Matt. And um, I'm like, hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm transferring to Drexel. Do you mind? Um, can I can I join the group? How easy is it? And he had just started it probably a couple of weeks prior with his friend Joe. You know, I became a big part of the group. So uh, we were getting university funding to go different places. And and I didn't even really think of it as far as like a, an investigative type thing. I thought of it more as like, you know, just getting together with, you know, like minded people going to cool places. You know, I'm a big history buff. Um I really enjoy the art. I was going to go for architecture. I actually went for engineering, but I, I enjoy architecture and, and, and love the old buildings. So that's really the, the, the main goal of me joining this group. And um, one of the very first places that we got to investigate, and it wasn't really an investigation. It was more of a pre-investigation, uh, uh, more of like a tour after hours, was Eastern State Penitentiary. and. Um, I'm also embarrassed to say that I didn't know too much about Eastern State, even though I lived right over the bridge in New York and South Jersey. Um, you know, I've seen it on TV and stuff. I've seen not the paranormal shows, but just, you know, just the the prison itself. Um, I didn't know too much about it. So I was really intrigued to just to go there. Um, so we had a tour. I don't even know if they do them like this anymore, but it was after hours. I forget if we we connected with somebody that worked there or, or what the situation was, but it was one of the other group members I got us in. I brought my friend Max, um, same one that had the experience at uh, at um, the tavern uh, years prior. And um, we're walking through, and I don't know what what uh, possessed me to go in one of the cells by myself, but I did. I, I had a, a voice recorder, and I'm in one of the cells. And in this cell block, I don't know if it was cell block one. I can't remember the exact cell block, but um, you, you you used to be able to shut the doors. I don't think you could do it anymore, but you could shut the doors, like a wooden door on the outside, and then there's like a metal cage door. And I think either I shut it or my friend shut the, the door. And I was in there. It was really dark. There's a, there was like a skylight type thing where, you know, the moonlight came in and or the street, probably the street lights uh, more likely were coming in. And it was so dark and I'm just standing there. I'm still thinking my friends are right outside and I'm standing there and then I feel something um, on my back, like, like a t something like tugs my shirt. Now my first inclination was like, all right, it's probably my shirt, like folded up. I, you know, turned around. I'm like, okay, that that's, that's, you know, my, my, my hair on my back, my neck is standing up, but I'm like, you know, let's be rational, Zach. It's just, you know, your shirt. Well, right then and there, I heard a giggle, like a child's giggle. And I was like, what, what in the world? Like, why am I hearing that in a prison? So when I heard that, I, I looked over to the door thinking it was my friends. Immediately I saw, um, like an out, like a silhouette. And I'm thinking it's my friends. I'm about to say something when 
right before I said something, um, it sunk in like, wait a second, the door shut. Like that couldn't be my friends. And then that's like when all the, like, I guess the emotions sunk in and, and it was, it was one of the scariest images that I've seen. It was a silhouette. There was two dark eyes. Um, I guess the silhouette is more of like a, a, a lighter color, maybe like a whitish. It's still dark because it was in a dark room, but um, the, the eyes I, I'll never forget were like darker than, than dark. I, I wish I could put it into words, but it was just like nothingness. And I, I was, I was terrified. And still in my head, I was thinking maybe it's my friend or something like that. So I yelled out to them. And and when I yelled out to them, I hear them yelling back down the hall. So again, it was another like flood of emotions. Like, okay, that's definitely not them. Like there's without a shadow of that, that's not them. I just saw a figure. And 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 it gets better because so so obviously that night, you know, I was freaking out. I I couldn't sleep and and um, I, I guess in my mind, it was, it was more of what is, what was that? Was it a hallucination? Was it, you know, my, my eyes playing tricks on me based on like the, the low light, uh, every rational thought in my mind was trying to, um, pretty much debunk what happened. Um, so the next day we went back and it wasn't like we, we never, we didn't get to do an actual tour of the history side of it because it was, it was at night. Um, so we went back and did the, the day history tour. So, um, and it was, you know, it was, it was just like a cheap tour we went through and it was a good tour. It was just, it was just, you know, cheap for college students. It was, it was cheap to go through, but, um, we went through and the one section there was, um, they talked about how they'd have these masks over the prisoners so they wouldn't see each other. And you know, it was like a black and white image, but it was these, you know, the, this mask over their head with two eyes cut out and and for the third time like the the emotions literally just flooded in because that is exactly what i saw and it still is ingrained into my 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 mind to this day and i tried everything like i I was like, maybe I saw that, you know, passing or something. We didn't even go in that section the night before. And I, I tried every way possible to understand. Maybe I, I had to have seen that before. The route that we took, there's no other images of this. So that right there was like, <laughs> it's still like the defining moment that really, really propelled me on this journey. And that's terrifying and amazing all at once and exhilarating. So I'm going to ask you this question. And I ask a lot of people, like, obviously, first glance, once it was processed, so your first definition would be, I saw a ghost. What do you think a ghost really is? I'm sure you've had plenty of time to think about that. But, you know, early on in this conversation, what what is a ghost? So you know what? I'm I'm still... I'm still, you know, the jury's still out for me because my engineering mindset, you know, my, my, my background of, of, you know, being very scientific and, and engineering based, I like to think that whatever we're interacting with, it's either possibly an echo or, or an actual blip into the past or the future. Um, very similar to, uh, the movie interstellar. I think that's all, I think Christopher Nolan came up with a, a great story, um, that it interweaved paranormal and, and science. And I, and I still think about that or, um, it's some other type of interdimensional type transient energy. Um, uh, for me, it's, it's not people that have passed on. I don't think, and, and I think part of that is echoed through, my, my, uh, my, my religious, my religious beliefs too. Like I, 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 when I, when I, when my belief, when you die, you either, you go two places, you're going to heaven or hell. And, and I, and I, I, I try to keep that out of my overall paranormal engineering type, um, discovery, you know, to, you know, to have a level playing ground, but we all come to the table with biases. So that's always in the back of my mind. Um, so that's why I always try to tend towards the, the I guess the the time loop type situation to to make sense in my brain. 
Sure. And again, you know, I think that's the direction we're headed in to give it some kind of explanation because people have experienced these things throughout history, period. They have. And and many, many credible people have. So it's not, you know, I think it's time that we approach it in a different way. And I, I, su- I suspect that what you are doing and what, and what some people in quantum science are doing, they're trying to analyze alternate dimensions, parallel realities. Uh, and one day we might have an explanation as to what everybody is seeing. I had a couple of encounters, but that's it in my entire life. I think two profound encounters enough to speak of. In your case, you probably have seen a lot. But just to speak on one thing, um, now, in regard to religious beliefs, do you believe it's possible that somebody, somebody's spirit, after their body dies, can be caught in a, in a limbo situation or some kind of purgatory where they're wandering the earth? Is that a possibility? So from, from my act, my personal religious beliefs, I don't think that. I, I think more in the lines of if we are seeing somebody that did pass on, you know, maybe it's possibly an angel that's coming to visit or it's, it's, um, and the other, the, the darker side, something demonic. And, and, you know, there's a lot, obviously in the Bible, there's, there's lots of talk about either side. Um, and, and that's what, that's what always trips me up. It's like, I have to, to really, I guess, segregate it in my mind. Um, I try not to put too much of the religious side into it because if I do, if I dig too deep, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting into a realm that, you know, maybe I shouldn't delve into, but if I try to kind of keep it, not, you know, not, not think of it in a religious aspect and kind of go approach it more in the scientific side, you know, maybe I can uncover something that, you know, will one day be a, you know, a proven science, um, a new phenomenon that wasn't previously understood, but we can finally understand it. Would you say after that encounter in the prison, that is your quest? You know, um, in other words, would you say that your quest after that was to analyze more phenomena through science as opposed to a religious perspective or the perspective that I think many people have had throughout history is that these are discorporated spirits and then in other cases are demonic entities, different things visiting us. I believe they're very real, just as you do, you know, whatever real is, but they, it's a true occurrence. It's happened to a lot of people. And I believe they influence people. Um, I believe that a lot of these ghost stories we all know are, are true stories. Uh, even the Amityville case, whereas a lot of people say it was a hoax. I don't believe that. I, I, you know, George and Kathy Lutz took that story to their grave and, uh, I feel like they had a true experience there. A lot of people, you know, just shake it off and say, oh, they, they benefited from it and they made a lot of money from it. But there was no way they would have known it was going to be as, as, a, as a hit at it, as it was and that it was going to make as much money as it did. There's just not a possibility to know that beforehand. They left their house in 28 days, so I believe there's something to that story, even if other people didn't experience something in that house after. How do you feel about popular ghost stories like that? So that's actually interesting. I, you know, I, my first time I've ever seen Animeville was, I think it was the remake with Ryan Reynolds, which, you know, it was fairly good. I, I went back, obviously, to watch the original, but that that's one of the movies that really stuck with me. Um, and I do agree. I think at that time, like you said, there's no possible way that they would have known how popular it would have been or, you know, to, to make, you know, to have fame after it or for whatever you, you would get from it. Because nowadays, obviously it's, it's the total opposite. I feel like the field is so muddied that every person is trying to find, you know, whether they have a haunted object or, or a haunted house or whatever it is, they're trying to cash in on this whole phenomena that, that really did start. Well, I mean, obviously it happened before, but I think that the, the major catalyst was, you know, ghost hunters that really, at least in the, in the United States, that really set that path forward to, to our current um, status. So I, I do think, I think popular culture has really changed the field. One to bring more awareness, which is great. 
but at the same time, I think it's, like I said, it's muddy the waters to where it's really hard to discern, you know, who's being honest, who's telling the truth and, you know, who's actually having these experiences. I think it's okay. So, and and I agree with you. It definitely, those waters have been muddied and, um, and it's oversaturated. And before I decided to do this episode, I wanted to approach this. I knew you were going to have a lot to say and in an interesting stories to tell and, and a unique perspective, I would say, or at least a lesser heard perspective on ghost hunting these days. And just my perspective on what the future of this is going to be is exactly what you're saying is that it's more of a um, scientific perspective, analyzing on a, on a quantum level, on the idea that there are parallel universes or parallel dimensions or versions of us and past, present, and future might be colliding. And that's a great perspective. Um, you know, there was a movie that was made some years ago I called uh, John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. And the essential idea of that was that evil lived on a subatomic level. So there was a quantum perspective even in that movie, this horror film that came out, you know, when I was a kid. And I love that idea. And I think to challenge the, the problem that you just brought up is that just do what you're doing. You know, and our conversation tonight is part of that contribution. It's to spark the brain for another perspective, one that you won't get from ghost adventures or stuff like that. You know, no offense to these guys, but they made the same show about a thousand times. No, I I totally agree. Um, I think right now it's actually really interesting because we saw within the last few years how big this whole paranormal entertainment industry has gotten. And it always has ebbs and flows. It keeps, you know, having that cyclical nature. Um, for me, I, I will admit I started using a lot of this stuff. I started, you know, when I started off, I, I, I thought this was the way to go. But as I kept doing it and I realized, you know, there's lots of false positives. And, and at the end of the day, these were devices that were specifically made for paranormal investigating. I mean, I would talk to my coworkers, you know, in the engineering field and a lot, most of them are skeptics. I don't, I, it's hard to find a, somebody else that's, you know, in the, in the same mindset as me. But, um, what would happen is I, you know, they would say, Zach, if, if you brought this evidence to us, you know, you, you found a spirit on a spirit box or you, you, you had a hit on a REM pod to, to me as an outsider, like what, what does that mean to me? That means nothing. You, you're, you're showing me a device that's supposed to look for spirits and it's going to find the spirits. So if you really want to, you know, examine this field, you have to start at square one. I mean, there, there may be a device that could be made to do just this, but I, I can guarantee you that the research for the REM pod, the spirit box was, was not formally done, you know, in a, in a scientific method. Um, and that's where the, I kind of have my devices. That's how, that's how I've been approaching the subject, starting from square one, collecting as much data as possible. That's amazing. And I cannot wait to dive into how you're engineering these devices and how you approach them. I just want to know, after that profound experience at the prison, I'm assuming there was another one after that. Well, there was. So I'm actually glad you circled back because I, I forgot. I forgot the best part. So, so after having the experience the next day, uh, pretty much validating that experience by seeing that image, um, it wasn't till I think it was probably a week or so later that I actually got around to listening to the recording because I had a recorder in my hand the whole time. And it's, it it still sends shivers down my spine. Um, there right as something, you know, I felt something on my back. There was a class A EVP, electronic, electronic voice phenomena, that said, watch your back. Like it was clear as day. And, and it, it, like I said, the, the story, it, it's crazy because it has literally every facet. Like there, there's, there, there's the visual thing. There, there's the, the, the auditory um, side of it, the, um, you know, the, val the, the validity the next day, and then going back and hearing that EVP. You know, it's really important to me. Um if, if we can, can I get access to that and allow the audience to hear some of that, like around this time right now, uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I could, I could definitely send it to you. Of course. Fantastic. I suppose we'll have a couple of these moments throughout. 
Uh, so here is an example of what Zach recorded at the prison. So, okay, so the recording is over. Come in and tell me now what that was, what we listened to, or what you think we just heard. So to me, I mean, it, it's tough because when you show other people or, or let other people listen to a recording, they'll hear different things, obviously. I mean, that's just human nature. You know, the, the was it the blue or gold dress? Um, there, there's all those different audio things that you could hear two different words. And I, I knew right away in, in my mind, I heard watch your back. Um, I had a, my one cousin was listening to it. I think he told me he heard it's a fact um, and, and a couple of different variations. But I know at that exact moment, the recorder wasn't moving because it was right before I, I moved to, to feel my back. And um, I, I, I said, I, I know exactly what it is. It, it I guess if you really dived into it, you, you, you may, I don't know. It's, it's, really, it's tough because it's almost for hard for me to look back at it and, and look at it with like, a, or listen to it with a fresh set of ears. Um, cause it's so ingrained in my brain, but to me still to this day, it's, it's clear as day, you know, watch your back. And do you, I mean, so what's speaking to you? That's the, you know, that's the question. You, you're, you're saying it must be something, some parallel universe. And again, this is all assumption, but let's say whatever this was had a consciousness. Do you believe that whatever said that to you had a consciousness or what you were experiencing was like a movie almost? It was something that was happening in some other time period and you were just there to listen to the words. No, that's tough too. Cause I mean, obviously, you know, they have residual hauntings, which is, you know, it's essentially like a movie, like you said, playing over, or they have what they call intelligent. I mean, I, I don't think intelligence is the best term for it. It's, it's basically just acknowledging you're, you're there conscious, I guess. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you take a third person perspective and think, well, you know, it's a watch your back, you turned around, you heard a giggle, um, and then you saw something, you know, maybe it could be telling you something like but then again at the same time i'm sure the term watch your back was probably probably said a lot of times in, in prisons um i don't know back in the day how how it worked but i'm sure it's it's something that was, was often said so i don't know it's tough i, I feel like there, there's like a I, I don't like to use the term like veil and all that stuff like the like what a lot of people that are super into the paranormal like understanding like mediums and psychics and stuff, they have their own terminology. I, I like to try to be more scientific with it, but I guess the, the atmosphere, the veil, if you will, was thinner in the sense that this portal or, or whatever, I was like almost going into that, that time frame, or, or they were delving into our time frame. It, it's, it's, it's such a, it's such an interesting, um, concept especially when you think of like quantum entanglement and and, and all the different uh, uh things in quantum physics I, it still goes through my my brain but i don't know it's a really tough to tell I, I i was i think more in the lines of it being more of like a movie playing over than something intelligent because even if you're in a certain situation especially if there's a you know there was a lot of activity in that that time period um you can always misconstrued something that would be residual or just play over as something intelligent so it's tough i mean unless you're having like a full-on conversation and they're answering things like super relevant my mind always goes to kind of a, a replaying of events now yeah, and, and we'll get into this with your own personal experience but how do you feel about uh people who have claimed to have been assaulted by these unseen forces, everything back to the Doris Byther case of the early seventies, very famous case. A book was written about it, and then a movie called The Entity, a terrifying story, and um, or any other poltergeist activity, things that are thrown around, people that suggest. And I've spoke to you know I, I've spoken to quite a few of them that that suggest that they've been assaulted by these unseen forces. First, has anything like that ever happened to you, and how do you feel about that? So if you asked me this, what, four, it's about four years ago now, four years ago, I would probably say 
most of the people that are saying that either have some type of psychological issue or maybe the environment in some way was affecting them and, you know, for them to believe that. And like I said, that was always from a scientific engineering kind of mindset. You know, how is that possible for there to be an actual attack? You know, I will say that my mind has changed on that because when we were, um, I, we did the show, uh, uh, a special on A&E called the world's biggest ghost hunt, um, at Pennhurst asylum. And we were there two weeks. Um, we stayed, you know, on campus, we didn't even leave. We didn't get hotels or anything, but I think it was more of like an experiment of what would happen to these individuals. It was me, my cousin, my friend, Max again, um, and, and these two other uh, girls that were with us. And essentially towards the end, I mean, we were so tired. We filmed, we did a lot of the, the, the production stuff and towards the end, you know, we were all super drained, but, uh, we went into, it was called the Devon building and they had a basement and it was, um, uh, they called it Candyland. Now there was like pictures of, uh, I guess kids playing on like, um, pretty much looked like Candyland. There was like elephants and, and like, uh, candy canes and stuff painted on the walls. Um, so one version of history says basically that was just painted afterwards. You know, that actually wasn't there when Penhurst was, um, a hospital for these, these, these kids or these, these individuals. But um, anyway, we were in there and my cousin, Austin, also a big skeptic, you know, very, he's a mechanical engineer. He was actually meditating with uh, the other girl that was with us, Allie. Yeah, That's the first time he ever opened himself up. He was down there and he had the most profound experience. It was, it was a full on panic attack. And he, 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 the way he said it, basically he, he felt like he was in that moment. He was in Candyland when it was. Um, you know, an actually functioning hospital at Penhurst, and you know, he, he was seeing the nurse. He was asking for the nurses to come. He felt like he was one of those individuals. It, it was for me being, you know, because the only reason we were all there was because you know I brought the group, like I brought my cousin and my friend there. We 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 did this journey together, and that emotionally hit me because like, what did what did I open my cousin up to? Like he his heart rate was going. They had to call the medics in for, for production and all, and um. I, I, for the longest time, I was so skeptical. I was like, Austin, like, are you just making this up? Like, are, are they paying you or something to, to, you know, amp up this thing? Cause not too much is happening. The, the, the moment I knew was, it was, it was really real was when we went back to our, uh, we had cots in this one tent that we were staying in. We, we were supposed to be on camera all the time, but you know, back where we were sleeping, we had some privacy. He went back there and the producer was like, Hey Zach, get Austin out here. I mean, we have to, you know, we have to talk to him. I went back there to get him and he was in tears calling his, um, it was his girlfriend at the time. Now he's married, his wife talking to her. It was like two o'clock in the morning and he, he was like, he was in, in full on tears and that, that doesn't happen for, for Austin. So I knew that how, how real that moment was since then he always kind of chalks it up. Oh, it was just you know, overly tired. You know, we're amped up and you know, it was, it was too much energy drinks. But for me, that kind of opened a doorway. Like, you know, there is, there is some, I say danger, but there, there's some connection that we maybe not understand. We will, we don't understand right now, but it could really affect you. And, and it made, it changed my whole perspective on, you know, how, I don't know if we say dark or just how dangerous this actually could be. So now if you ask me that question, I, I will say anybody that, that ha- talks about an experience of being attacked or being, um, I don't know, possessed or, or, or even, you know, under, uh, under the influence, under like, a uh, um, oppression. Um, I, I believe them. I, 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 because what happened to Austin was so real and, you know, it didn't even happen to me. I, I saw it firsthand and, and, um, I'll, I'll never forget that. There are those who say that this quiet town holds many secrets. Legend has it that beneath this very tower, a dark force had its eyes set on the children. We were told 
that what was going on there was for the benefit of humanity. What would you say to the people who say, well, all these children were kidnapped and murdered and you were a part of it, what would you tell them? You I tell did them? approve of it, but there was nothing I could do about it. They wanted a large number of programmed boys to be used for mind control operations. And there are others who say it's still happening to this day. I don't know, I for myself find it a little suspicious that all the evidence has been conveniently destroyed. Let's put it this way. If you're sitting there with 20 guns pointed at you, what are you going to do? Whatever the hell they want! Watch Montauk Chronicles now for free on Tubi, Plex, Roku, and available for download on Amazon and Apple TV. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. It's events like these that have happened throughout history that are there are accounts, like I had said before, from very credible people throughout history, but also these are things that informed fiction. You know, everything from Charles Dickens to H.P. Lovecraft to Stephen King, if you go deep into the root of those stories, they are from real life experiences, or at least what people claim to have experienced. Uh and in your case, you know, if we were to take any one of those stories, we can incorporate that into a ghost story or a horror film and it'll work. So these are fantastic uh, experiences and they're unique, even though, like I said, there are 50 different ghost hunting shows and everybody seems to be able to have an experience on every episode, which I know because I've made television is, is not true for every case. Um, that doesn't mean I don't believe this stuff is real. I do. I've experienced it myself. It's just not as easy as it seems to, to occur. And they're doing that for television. On the other hand, though, uh, I do love some of the portrayals in fiction. Uh, I don't know if you had seen the movie 1408. It's based on a Stephen King story. But there is that interdimensional aspect to John Cusack. He's a writer. He's a He's, he's kind of a ghost hunter, actually, and he writes these ghost hunting books. He's you know, the bargain basement ghost hunter, and he ends up going to this hotel, and there is an interdimensional metaphysical aspect to that story, which I love so much. Um, have you seen any movie or motion picture or, or, or read a good work of fiction that kind of applies to what you've experienced? Well, I mean, like I mentioned before, I, I think Interstellar is um, is it a good example of the way that I portray the paranormal, um, or at least the way that I you know perceive it. But I wouldn't really say that's a, that's a work of uh, horror. I, I mean, it's obviously it's fiction. But one thing that comes to mind though is uh, all of the iterations of um, the haunting of Hill House. I mean, whether that be the haunting with um, what's his name, uh, Liam Neeson and Owen Wilson. Oh, going back before that. Remember the original? Oh yeah, the original. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, the original. I'm I, the, fir- the my first experience was watching, <laughs> watching that version. Um, but all, but even going through to the uh, the modern one, um, it was the haunting of uh, the haunting on um, Netflix. For some reason, I don't know why it sticks with me. Something with with the house, the 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 story of. I don't know why it, it, it that always comes back to me and at any time that I'm in in a certain, you know, scenario whether it's, you know, in a, an abandoned asylum or a haunted house whatever mm-hmm. uh, for some reason those images those those stories always come to my my mind and and I have to actively kind of like take it out because I know 
fear is powerful. I feel like fear really can drive people to believe different things. I think that's one of the biggest things that I like to examine is a lot of the psychological effects that happen to individuals, whether that's based on, you know, circumstantial, you know, just them being in an environment where, you know, obviously it it ensues fear. It it basically um, invites them to, to, to be fearful or uh, whether that's environmental factors affecting people. I, 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 I can't, tell you how many times carbon monoxide, even carbon dioxide. I mean, I'm in my basement right now. Um, I got to look at the the updated levels, but carbon dioxide levels, oh, sorry, carbon dioxide levels within a matter of an hour or so, oftentimes double, especially if you don't have proper ventilation. And when that happens, you often, um, I mean, when it gets high enough, you, you can have like cognitive dissonance where basically your your brain's being choked off um, of the proper cells to, to, to actually function properly. So, you know, you can hallucinate, you can have whole, whole, a whole bunch of different experiences. And I think that's where my mind always goes with, with when I'm in these sense, I, I try to take out the, the, the fiction, the storytelling side of it. And then I try to think of what's actually happening. And, and, and oftentimes I always come back to the environmental factors because whether something is actually happening in the environment that we can record, or it's, the way the environment is shifting to affect your your mind, um, I, I'm still trying to understand that that whole dynamic. Now, you had mentioned fear. Uh, do you believe, in in some way, on some level, that if you are afraid, let's say you have something in your subconscious, you watched a scary movie, now you're in this place, and that idea. You go in there afraid of that something might happen in this place. Do you believe that uh, might inadvertently inspire an event? Yeah. I, I, so I, I think the way that we approach paranormal investigating, especially from the, the television side, because I feel like that's the modern day uh, investigator, even if they don't watch the show, it's always based on, you know, you go in, you do the research, you try to dig up the history, you try to hear the the firsthand encounters, and then you do it. I, I think that's that's backwards. I think in order to truly use the scientific method, try to come in without any biases. Um, I mean, I, oftentimes, if if there's um, supposedly a woman that's supposed to haunt the corner, or or even if there was a movie made for this actual location, your mind, even subconsciously, is going to go to that event, or or, or at least think about it. Um, so I think people should go into locations if possible blind, um, and almost do like a double blind study too, where, where you have maybe someone that, that knows the history, they go in and they try to figure it out. And then someone that goes in blind. Um, I know that's often hard to do, especially with larger places, you know, these days, everything's out there. I really do think on a subconscious level, even if it's just in your mind, Having those stories, those movies, um, those events really alter the, the, the actual outcome for, for each individual. And, and I think it's almost near impossible to actively try to, in your brain, try to rule it out. I think you have to take that extra step and, and, and literally go in blind. And that makes sense. It's almost like finding a baseline and and clearing it and going in there and not knowing what to expect or knowing any previous history of the place usually. Is that, does that also include it in what you're suggesting? Yes, exactly. So that, I mean, I know it's, it's almost near impossible these days, unless you find, you know, a place that's never been investigated before or private residences. Um, So I know it's tough, it's, but in order for the scientific method to, to truly be carried out, you know, in a proper way, you have to come in with almost no variable. You don't, you want to roll out as many variables as possible. And because I really think, I mean, the the mind is, is so, so interesting. We still don't have, you know, even a fraction of it understood. And I mean, oftentimes I think like when, when you're in a place void of uh, a lot of your senses, for instance, I mean, obviously you do it in the dark. You don't have to do it in the dark, but most of the time everybody does investigating in the dark. There's a number of reasons I can go off a tangent on why or why not. Um, but it's often in the dark. 
it's often fairly quiet. I mean, you're kind of listening for things. So when you're in that, that heightened awareness and you, you maybe witness something, you know, like a shadow or you, you maybe hear something, I, I don't know if it's, it's actually a, a physiological um, effect or not, but what, what I'm thinking is, is your mind is kind of filling in those gaps and who knows where it's filling in those gaps from? Is it filling in from, like I said, pop culture, um, you know, movies that you've seen in the past? Or is it, you know, just kind of coming with random stuff? That's, that's really why, like, it's, it's good to go in blind. And, and, and almost like to a point where sometimes it, it's, it's best to almost take the, the human element out of the investigation. It's, I know it's not as, as exciting <laughs> when you're not there in person, but, you know, plopping in a device and then kind of just letting it sit for a while, even if it's just a long baseline to understand what's going on, um, you know, pretty much second by second. Um, and then start intru- introducing like catalysts, like, okay, introduce a human element. Does that change the environment? Um, and that's really where we have to, to, to go back to, um, you know, it's all, it's all about reducing as many variables as possible. And, and I do, I do think these, these stories, these, um, you know, when, when someone tells you there's a place that's haunted, well, even if you don't want to believe it, part of it's gonna, you know, surface in your subconscious at one at one moment so i and i appreciate you telling me all of this so if you can take me through step one to the end of how you after your experience of the last what are we talking about like 20 years um how do you approach a place now when you enter what devices do you use have you invented any of these devices yourself and how do they work so after probably using every single device out there um, over the years, I, I've like I said, I, I've come to the conclusion that anything that's out there as far as REM pods, spirit boxes, the SLS, you know, connect camera, it's always geared towards finding those positives. Even if they're false positives, it's, it's, it's geared towards trying to find some type of phenomenon that we don't know if it's paranormal or not the, 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 the actual science and research is not there. It's just not, um, no matter what anybody says. Um, so I like to look at it from pretty much a square one going in. We don't know anything. We don't know. Like people will talk about EMF all the time. Well, I'll be honest. EMF is like, cause say if you say, if you have a hit on EMF, it's like saying somebody's, uh, Oh, I saw a light. Okay. Well, is the light, What's the brightness or intensity of that light? What's the color of that light? What's the direction of where that light came from? It's just not giving you enough information. And oftentimes, these devices that are used, even not on the TV spectrum, even in, in the field, I mean, people have the real time, you know, blinking lights and the, the data and stuff, but it's not recording any data. Um, so unless they're actively, you know, have a database in their mind of of what's significant, what's not. I don't think the human mind's even capable of, of, of storing that much information. So other than a visual medium, everything, these events recorded, there's no way to actually analyze this in the future. So when I go into a location now, I bring my multi-sensors. I call them vast, uh, wide array multi-sensors. And you could buy different things in the market, but um, I, I like to make them myself because it's, it's a lot cheaper to, to, to put a bunch of different sensors together. Let me pull up. I'm going to make sure I... So the latest iteration of the one I'm using right now, um, hold on one second, let me uh, pull up because I have an app. No worries, no worries. So we're looking at temperature, humidity, air pressure, CO2, it's carbon dioxide, TVOX, which is total volatile organic organic compounds, Um, particulate matter, uh, 2.5 microns. I mean, it goes all the way down. You can go down to 0.5 microns or all the way up to 10 microns. Um, CO, carbon monoxide, NO2, carb, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone, which is O3. Those are the current parameters that I that I look at. But I mean, obviously, in this age of digital electronics and, and, and circuits, there's there's so many sensors. Like any measurable facet of the environment or or anything at all, there's a, there's a sensor for it. So I mean, there's so there's what happens when there is activity. Are there spikes in any of those particular categories 
more so than others when there's a, a haunted house or there's a poltergeist activity or something that you've run into that's anomalous. So right now, I had there's a couple of things that I've been been looking into, but I think for me it's more understanding the the larger data set so that it then can create a more accurate model. So right now I, I've seen a lot of interesting things with temperature um, and humidity and then uh, ozone, which is O3. Um, I'm still trying to understand the correlation between them, but like I said, we have to kind of start from square one as if we don't know anything at all. And pretty much, like I said, go, go as a baseline, get all these different um, parameters. The, the difficult part is, when you're when you're recording all this stuff, if there is a spike, if there is like a drop or or a change at all, without some type of trigger, whether that be like um, you experiencing something at that exact moment, you know, so you can uh, look at the time card to see when it happened, or you know, you have a, a visual phenomenon on a camera or something auditory, it's hard to tell the significance of of those um, events. So right now I'm developing, I guess, a centralized database that has all this data coming from different locations, you know, obviously the same location over and over um, that will look at these trends and patterns. And I guess the main goal is to eventually look at the commonalities, the similarities between um, these perceived events and the changes, the delta changes, whether that be like a 5%, you know, decrease in humidity over you know, a two second time span or, or whatever, and, and kind of use like a, a lot of, it's a lot of data analysis to do, but, um, but basically when you have that like Delta change, there, there's the, the almost perfect key of, of changes. Then that's when you can create a device that essentially will show you, you know, when an actual activity, a paranormal activity is happening or supposed paranormal activity or environment change is happening. Um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Twister, but it's kind of like, uh, the Dorothy research device that they would send up in the tornado so they can, you know, gather all that data so that they can then prepare for a tornado when it's going to happen. That's, that's kind of how I see these devices going forward. Um, but right now I, I've seen a couple interesting correlations between ozone and um, different activity that's happened. Um, and then obviously temperature and humidity. One thing I wanted to discuss with you. So these energies that are being exp- these energies that are experienced in a variety of ways, do you feel they could have influence on people's moods and even their actions? Um, definitely. Now, I mean, we can go into energy. I, I would say just as far as ambient temperature. I mean, obviously, there there's, there's scientific studies that say that, you know, different temperatures can, can change your, your mood. And then then you start thinking about things. Okay, if the temperature and humidity are this certain level, you're in this abandoned, you know, this abandoned building. There's probably going to be molds, and if there's molds, there could be different type of spores that you know somehow psychologically affect you. Um, there's so many different things. Even even air pressure is a big uh, cognitive. Um, like there, there's there's cognitive effects that you can have when air pressure is too great, or, or even too little. That's why I love like looking into these environmental factors because I- I'm almost into the mindset where if this isn't a physical like recordable phenomena in and of itself, maybe it's something that again is like the right key to affect the human mind, whether to open it up or to to have you know to basically have these experiences by kind of preconditioning your mind with these, these correct parameters. And I don't even have necessarily think it's like, you know, a temperature of like 74, like it's not like a, an actual temperature. I think it's more in like in lines of the Delta changes that happen over a certain period of time. And, and going back to what you were saying about uh, seeing this in, in television stuff, they have the, the closest thing I would say is the EDI device, the EDI plus it uh, measures temperature, humidity, pressure, um, EMF, I believe. Maybe it's not. Yeah, EMF. Um, and the problem with that is, I mean, they're not as sensitive as the ones that I use, but it records to an SD card. Um, then you have to later go back, analyze it. I'm going to be honest. I guarantee you 99.9% of the people that use those devices use them as a real-time device, and they will not go back and do the data analysis. Um, so that's why 
my devices, I, I like to have them like connected via uh, um, wireless network. So basically you have, you can even have like AI basically gather these um, different parameters and, and eventually like my main goal in the future is to have a, a, a series of devices essentially maybe geolocated without um, a location or whatever. So you can understand a virtual map essentially of, of the environment. So then you can see all these different changes and, and my mindset's going to basically having like maybe an AR or VR type experience where you basically, you can put these glasses on and you can see a visual representation of, of these changes, not necessarily graphs or numbers, but maybe like a different color or something in that, that, um, uh, the, the location of something that's changing. And again, if we get the data and we can come up with a model of what happens during a paranormal occurrence, we can then say, okay, if you're in a location, you got a sensor over there, you know, out the corner of your eye, you see that room is lighting up for some reason. You go over there and then you can get further data. You can you know, bring the cameras over. You can experience something yourself. You can bring the recorders. Um, so it's very like high tech, like futuristic, but uh, the technology is all there. I guess it's just the implementation of, of bringing everything together. With all of this, and again, this is some of the best, uh, I guess the best perspective on the scientific analysis of of um, these occurrences, this phenomena, hauntings, poltergeists, you know, uh, outside of Michael Persinger, which I thought was an amazing experiment where he would bombard the brain with uh, electromagnetic energy uh, to simulate perhaps an effect uh, uh, on the brain of geomagnetic waves or electromagnetic waves that might be causing this haunting phenomena on the brain. Um, this is some of the best stuff I've heard because again, once again, like you said, it's all done in real time. I think it's people that don't really consider the capabilities of the devices uh, while they're using them at these locations. It seems to be more of like recreation and fun. And yeah, it can be fun. You know, I think just about anything has to be exhilarating one way or another that you're doing long term. It's it's attracting you to it. But what is your ultimate goal in this? Is it to prove that there is an anomalous thing happening at these locations, one that just simply can't be explained as any normal occurrence? Like eventually you're going to say, I have evidence that there is something happening here. Yeah, my my main goal is is long term, uh, eventually turning this field into a fully verifiable um, field of science. Uh, so, throughout history, like you said, there's there's been experiences. People have had so many experiences. I I will admit a lot of them I think are you know misconceptions. Maybe maybe they, their their minds are playing tricks on them, but there there's still a large percent that. I I hope that with these this equipment this the scientific side of it I can bring maybe a validation to to people that have had these experiences over the years. Um, when it comes to mediums and psychics and whatnot, um, I'm I'm still a, a big skeptic of that. Um, not necessarily like I, I don't think everybody's. So a lot of times, especially with the the modern modern age of of where this goes, I don't think a lot of people are in it with the best intentions i know there's a lot of you know people there's a lot of con artists that that try to, to try to feed in and feed off of people which is, is super tragic but at the same time the people that are really authentic I, I think there needs to be more studying into how that works and understanding that but i come from a side that i don't have any of these quote-unquote abilities i don't see that extra sense i don't see these things that these people are saying they see if I can't do that, maybe I can create a device or, or at least understand the data in, in a sense where I can create a device or a platform or something where I can also see through the same eyes that you're seeing through, um, or not you specifically, but whoever has these abilities. Um, so it's almost like a, a validation on that. And I think it's right now is a pivotal time because there's so much going on. The, the waters are so muddy that there's, you know, people that are take this group or that group, or, you know, you can't investigate at night. You can't investigate. You have to investigate at night back and forth, you know, the mediums, the, the spiritual side, all of that. I think there is, 
there's a space where all of this intersects. And, and I really do truly believe that if we can develop this, this community of people that get together and have a like-minded approach, you know, whether you're, you're a scientific person or not, but if you can, you know, even use the device uh, devices like this to go forward and, and we can feed an overall model, you know, this thing's going to get more accurate and accurate with time. I mean, obviously there'll be hiccups along the way, but we can get to a point where, you know, it's undeniable. It's like, it's literally publishable in a, in a scientific journal that you, you have this data to back it up. Cause right now, like you said, it's, it's for fun. And I understand that. I, I completely understand the fun side. That's why I got into it. But I think it can convert into a field where it could, it could even be more fun. It, it could be more entertaining, especially when we have the, the, the groundwork of, of understanding what a device can record. Right now, it's just like it's for fun for the sake of being fun. Did you uh, have you thought about opening up your um, research to other people? In other words, teach, you know, offer courses and using the exact same methods that you do to help people improve on their their ghost hunting, so to speak. Uh, yes, actually. So uh, a while back, I thought of uh, of a of a thing or of a platform. Originally, I called it the uh, Metaphysical Discovery Institute. And, and I like that word metaphysical because it's almost like an agnostic, like you don't have to, the paranormal or, or ghost is, is kind of like a, still like a taboo word to, especially the scientific community. Um, but I feel like metaphysical is uh, a little bit more palatable. And um, I, I kind of want to bring everybody together to have, like you said, that that common ground, maybe like a scientific method, uh, a standardized approach. I mean, there's, there's standards in every field of engineering, every field of science. Um, but there's no standards in, in this practice. I mean, it, it's quite a large segment. If you, if you really look into the numbers, um, you know, whether it's just the, the viewers of these programs or the people that are actually into it, I, I believe the paratourism industry, you know, of ghost hunting and all is, is a $300 million a year industry. Um, so it's, it's, and obviously you go into horror films and all that, it's, it's even larger. So the interest is there. I, I think if, um, if we can pull together a, a standardized model that pretty much everybody can understand and, and go forward and, and a device where you don't have to look at the data, essentially it will collect the data it, in the back end. It will do all that. But at the same time, um, it could provide you with that information if you wanted it. Because I, I know there for everyone that, you know, I, I see it as a scientific side. I guarantee there's a bunch of people out there that just want blinky lights and, and, and want to see uh, scary things like that. Um, I still think that's that's capable. Uh, that, that there's a capability in that with, with these type of devices. Um, and, and overall, I have a vision for essentially a platform to, to bring this community together, a, a, a unique... Um, discovery platform, um, you know, whether you're a medium, a psychic, or, or whether you're, you're a complete uh, skeptic uh, that's, you know, in the scientific community or, you know, in between, anywhere in between. I, I think there's, like I said, the common ground. And, and if we do like a crowdsourcing of, of data, a crowdsourcing of, of research um, in this space, we, we can actually break meaningful ground rather than just be that uh, monkey see, monkey do uh, cyclical nature that we've seen for the last 20 plus years, at least in the, in the entertainment space. Yeah, well, I see a lot of that stuff. I mean, a lot of these devices are just electronic Ouija boards. You know, they're, again, they're fun. It's a pastime. But in your case, it seems like as an individual, you are at the very precipice of what I think was attempted in the, in the late 60s or early 70s in, let's say, the UCLA parapsychology lab that actually existed where they were taking it seriously for a minute. And, you know, we have the governments and some covert ops that have taken psychic abilities seriously. You know, they've worked with these things. This is 100% truth. They did these things. And so I wonder sometimes why for the rest of us, it's entertainment purposes only. And in your case, now in, in this world where everyone's connected through the internet and, you know, in the modern world, you could very well 
I mean, it's arguably what's certified and what's not, but you can be kind of a modern parapsychologist um, and, or, or an engineer, a parapsychology engineer, a metaphysical engineer, somebody who's analyzing these things as an independent who will end up with some very solid data at some point. Am I correct about all of this? I think it's possible. I mean, it all depends on um, the the perception that the public takes. I, I, I do agree back in the day when, when like I said, they, they had these studies, um, the government, you know, really took it serious and, and almost like it's like kind of wiped off the map. Now, my, my thought process is they found some really interesting things that they're like, okay, what's not tell the public about this. I mean, we have to have an edge, whether that be warfare or control, whatever you want to, whatever the purpose is. Um, so that's, that's what I'm thinking is there is all this stuff out there. So th- that almost brings me to the side. It's like, if I press too far, um, you know, what, what are the consequences going to be? I mean, I actually work for the government now. Um, nothing, you know, in this sense, but it makes me think it's like, you know, what, what, what don't we know that they already have, they, they already know. Um, and, and why has it been more or less silent uh, as it has been silent? Maybe it's, it's something happening in the background that, you know, whether public perception, you know, wasn't allowing the funding for it, or like, again, they have other ulterior motives that they can use these, this, I don't know, other dimension or something like almost like, like stranger things. Like it's, there's so much to it that for me, it's like, okay, if, if I'm not going to find the information my, you know, online or through the government or, or through other people, I'm going to figure it out myself. Well, I, you know, I strongly believe not to be a conspiracy theorist here, but they, they, whoever they are, they know a lot. They know a lot more than, than we do. They really do. They're, they're onto a lot more. They have been. And Perhaps maybe this is a time where a lot of us are considering that that might be the truth as opposed to just turning a blind eye and doing exactly what they want us to do is to just enjoy this stuff as entertainment, which I do enjoy this stuff as entertainment. But I think fiction and, um, of course, independent research that is not exactly a science yet can have a duality to it. It it, it can be entertaining. It can fill that space in life and in, in It can be enjoyable, but also it can further an idea and help an idea evolve, which I think is exactly what's happening because the simple electronic Ouija board way of ghost hunting that's been around for at least 20 years, right, uh, is, is very stale and it needs to be elevated. Even in TV, it would behoove some of these companies that, uh, really need to change their programming, uh, to try something different and sell something different to the audience, I would suggest something more stimulating. I mean, even my own shows, that's always what I'm doing, something different. And I feel like your approach is is fresh, even though you may not feel that way. I, I think you do. But to me, I hear these people all the time. I see, I see them from afar. A lot of the times I'm not interested in doing ghost hunting episodes per se, but I knew you would have something unique to offer. So can you take me into another story uh, before we head into the last section of this? Tell me another story, something that you experienced, something that really uh, made an impression on you. Hmm, let me think. Um, i trying to think of a good one that I've had. So although we've done a lot of investigations, you know, when I was at Drexel, um, through the university and then, um, you know, just on my own time, it's really been a lot of the, um, the private residences that kind of, kind of stuck with me. And and it's unfortunate because lots, lots of times I, I, even, even if they don't necessarily ask for it, you know, I don't, I don't want to just blast out who these people are and all, but, um, there was this one individual, very wealthy, uh, individual, in the Philadelphia region. And, um, she invited us out to our house. I, I, we would get, it's actually funny. You go back to when I was at Drexel, we would get emails left and right. Um, I guess because we were on the Drexel's main page and we had, you know, people would reach out. Oh, I had a ghost cat. One guy actually sent a, a, um, a recording of his stomach. He said there was a demon in his stomach. And I was like, it just sounds like you might, you know, you might need to eat some food or something. 
So it was really difficult to weed out like, uh, you know, who's crazy or who's, you know, who's looking for attention or who's going to kill us. Um, so I, I took a chance on this lady. I had no, I didn't know anything about her. So we go to her house and I don't even, I don't think I, I was, I don't, I don't know if I looked it up ahead of time or what, but we go to this house and, and I, I thought we we're lost, but we get to a gate. Well, we had to get buzzed into this gate and we pull up to this house and we go down this winding driveway. It's this massive 20,000 square foot mansion. It looked like it was like a James Bond villain house. I'm like, are we sure we're going to the right place? Uh, it was me. I, actually, my wife at the time, uh, or my girlfriend at the time was my wife now. It was her birthday. And I was like, you're, I know you don't like this stuff, but you're coming along with me because this is interesting. So we went there and um, the, the lady was very genuine. She, she, you know, she, she didn't want a lot of people in her circle of influence knowing, you know, that she believed or she has having the ex- these experiences because still it's like a taboo. Like when, when you come into, you know, professional sense, whether that be business or engineering, people don't like to talk about these things. And that's why another reason why I think there should be a space for people to get together, maybe not just Facebook groups or something, but like an actual community where people can, can talk about these things. But, um, but anyway, uh, we, I've done a series of investigations. Unfortunately, she sold the house not too long ago for like, for like 10 million plus I've had so many experiences there. Um, one was, what was it? The, one of the former owners of the house was like a big, uh, rail, what they called a, a rail, uh, railway magnet, um, big, uh, very big into the railroads. So, um, yeah, he was a really big business uh, man in um, the Philadelphia region. And, I, I actually, and I, I, I want to share it, but again, to keep the person anonymous, I don't, I had to have to ask. Um, I literally captured, captured what it looks like a, an apparition of, of a person walking by and, and, and you hear, um, an EVP. I forget exactly what it was because, um, it wasn't that clear, but it looks like a person's walking by and, and still to this day, I am like, was that something or was there some kind of a glitch in the camera? Like I, I like visually that's, that's something that like, I, I can't, I can't really reconcile with. I'm trying to understand it, but and again, it's not something that I I can share or I can like man, like crowdsource the community to understand what's going on because it's one of those, um, you know, those private investigations. Um, so that sticks with me. And, and there was a number of other, you know, circumstantial evidence that we, we got, EVPs on that really, you know, tied into the history of the house and how this lady was, was associated with the house. And, and I'm actually still, you know, in connection with this lady now, but, um, there's, there's so many things that, that I, I think if, if we all got together, especially, you know, non-private case like this, if we all got together and, and put our minds our collective minds together, we could really go to a new place that has never been you know experienced before. Are you ever afraid of what you might discover? You know, are you are you cautious of what you might discover? Do you feel like you might pick up something that you're going to take back with you in terms of an energy or something darker uh, that might affect your life, something negative? Uh, you know, all of these things, I've heard these stories before, and I truly think that there was a time when I was a kid that... Uh, something somehow followed me from one location to another because I had an experience two nights in a row at two different locations, never before and never after. Uh, do you ever fear or have you picked up something from a location? So far I haven't. And, and, and I want to, I want to keep it that way. Cause I, I don't necessarily fear for myself. Um, I, I fear more for, you know, if, if there is something that is possible to bring home, you know, I fear for my family. I fear for, you know, my, my young kids, um, you know, especially how innocent, you know, they would, they would be to, to something. And, and that more, that stems more from my religious perception of, of all of this. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people that maybe not even take the science side. They're, 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 they're very like, and, um, I guess agnostic as, as far as when they're looking at this, um, oh, they're, they're, they'll say, oh, there's never any th- such thing as a, a demonic thing, or there's never anything dark. Or then you have the people that said, everything's dark. I think there is a, there's an in-between. I, like I said, I, I try to dissociate the 
research that I do with with the the evil that I you know I know in my heart of hearts that that, that is out there in, in some form or another. Um, because I don't want I, I try not to want influence it to I maybe turn not turn off other people, but to 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 seem like I'm coming in with a bias. But I, I do fear. I, I do fear because I mean I, I at the end of the day, regardless if you believe there's something evil if or you don't, there are things out there that we do not understand. And, you know, whether that's there for good or bad purposes or it's, you know, completely harmless. There's always that possibility and, and you never know. Like I said, that, that experience that happened with my cousin, he, he will say to this day, oh, it was just me being exhausted, having a panic attack. But as a third person perspective, looking in, I saw the emotion. I saw everything that happened. And, and I truly do think there was some type of, maybe it wasn't evil. Maybe it was just a, a misunderstood, but there's some type of attachment there that um, I don't know if it followed him home or not, but. I've seen seems different changes in him that, um, you know, I, I, that almost seem like it stems from that point. So I, I am cautious. I know a lot of people in this sciencey type spectrum will be like, "Oh, that's that's garbage." But you know, I, I like I said, I have I have a unique perspective from my religious background that that um kind of you know let, lets me go in cautiously. It, it's funny you, your biggest opponents to the paranormal or, or the, or the science, the, the skeptic, the science skeptics. It's like, well, that's not possible. Like why, why are we thinking that? Uh, what is it? It was Carl Sagan that said absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's like, just because we haven't found it yet or found the right, you know, evidence that makes you want to believe doesn't mean it's not out there. Why do, why do we discredit the billions of people throughout history that have had, authentic experiences even if say a majority of them could be explained away by misconceptions there's still i mean there's whole civilizations that that centered their beliefs around different phenomena and uh, why, do, why do we discredit that I, I i think it's funny too because we think we have everything figured out oh we're in the 21st century you know we know it all but go back 100 years or so or you know 200 years whatever and you would tell somebody, hey, listen, I'm going to communicate with somebody around the globe in real time on this little device in my hand. The, the, you know, they would call that supernatural. They'd call that, you know, witchcraft or whatever. But look at us now. I mean, you can communicate around the world in real time, see, hear, um, and it's technology. And, and, I, and I think that some of the greatest scientists of all time, you know, Tesla, Edison, they've all had, whether it be stories or, or ideas of, of this space, and it's kind of a shame that the modern scientific community has turned a blind eye and, and no longer wants to go down this, what they call a rabbit hole. But for me, it, I think it's one of the final frontiers. There, there's so much that could be explored. And even if it's psychological, there's some type of mind um, aspect to it. That, that's that's the, the key. Um, there's so much that could be explored. And I, and I think not just explored, I think there's so much that can be gained. Having said what you've said about everything, about the science, your experience, your religious perspective, I ask this of every guest. When you do leave this physical form, uh, what would you take with you? And there's no right or wrong answer. Um, from my perspective, I, I don't think you take anything. I, I think um, maybe maybe your memories, maybe your, your life experiences, but you know, I, I think like I said earlier in the, in the program, I truly believe and you know, I, like I said, this is based on my faith. When you die, you're going to you know, one or two places. You're, you're going to be in, in the presence of God for eternity in heaven, or you're going to be, um, eternal separation from, from God, um, in hell. And, and, and that, like I said, that, that does, does play into some of the understanding, um, of, of the paranormal. But like I said, I, I try to, uh, disassociate it uh, to a point, but inevitably, like you said, like when you die, you know, there's, there's, there's something's going to happen. I mean, I, and I, I just, from my faith and, and especially the experiences I've had in the paranormal, I just, I definitely cannot think that just nothing happens. That there, there's definitely something else, and I, I think what we see, what our eyes see, what what we perceive is is only something that. Maybe we're only supposed to see. Maybe we're not supposed to, to to look more into the stuff that we we do. So maybe maybe at the end of the day, I'm doing 
doing a disservice to 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 what I should be. But um, I don't know. It, it, like I said, it, when when we die, yeah, you know, we're 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 taking maybe our life experiences, but uh, but we become something new. Um, I know some people will look at it as like an energy transfer. Um, but that's the way I think of it too, like a scientific aspect. I, I always think people look at religion and science and think they're so different, but honestly, I, I think they're, you know, they work perfectly in tandem and we don't understand that missing link sometimes, just like we don't have the unified theory of, of the, the quantum side and, and the, the larger, um, the physics model, but there's that, that unifying thing. And I, I truly think it's God that, that connects us and, you know, the science will explain away God and God will again explain away science. It's just a matter of perspective. Welcome back to Off to the Witch. I'm your host, Christopher Garitano, and I want to thank you for joining the conversation tonight. Perhaps we are finally witnessing the precipice of a serious scientific exploration of the afterlife. For all of our collective innovation over the years, life and the afterlife is still and will most likely remain the greatest of mysteries. Until next time, beware the shadows and try to enjoy the daylight. <laughs>